Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and good morning, Alex. Uh, welcome to Envy Smart. Uh, my name is Brad Clark. I'm an academic from the University of Melbourne, and uh, and welcome to this meeting. Uh, firstly, I'd like to pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, um, pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. But today we're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Alex Bond joining us all the way from England. I was going to say London, but I'm not sure. Um, and it's 7am in the morning for him there. So thank you so much for getting up early and um, giving uh, this presentation today. So I look forward to hearing it. Brilliant. Um, good morning, folks. My name is Alex Bond. My pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm the senior curator in charge of birds at the Natural History Museum uh, in London, although I live just a little bit north. Um, and with uh, Dr. Jen Labors at University of Tasmania, I help run the Adrift Lab. Um, and I also, on the side, uh, am one of the co-chairs of an organization called LGBTQ Plus STEM, um, which looks to promote and uh, support LGBTQ plus uh, researchers, uh, not just academics, uh, in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the hidden diversity that we see in science and how we've applied or, or taken that as an analog for our study of, uh, of plastic pollution in birds, which I think you may have heard some uh, about before in one of these earlier sessions. So, um, right, I was an incredibly uncool child. Um, so this is me, uh, probably about 1987 or 88. Um, I grew up in Eastern Canada, uh, which is you know a very rural part of the country. Um, yeah, not not the most uh, not the most socially uh, adapted <laughs> child, you could say. Um, and really, it's about the journey from 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 there to to where I am today. And growing up, uh, so you know, you, this is a, a woman named uh, named Elsie Wayne, uh, and she was the mayor of St John, New Brunswick, for gosh, about twenty years, and then a member of the Canadian Parliament. Uh, she was also a close family friend of my grandparents. Um, and uh, in the Canadian context, we legalized same-sex marriage in 2005 nationwide. So in the five to eight years leading up to that, there was quite a lot of public debate about same-sex marriage. Um, and Elsie Wayne was one of the most vocal opponents. Um, when I look back through the newspaper archives of our provincial newspaper um, from 2003, uh, it had this fantastic sort of vox pop, you know, why do you oppose gay marriage, uh, as it was called then. Uh, and, you know, it violates the rights of the straight community of Canada. Uh, every child deserves a father and a mother. Uh, you know, the sight of two men kissing and talking about sex is repulsive to me because that's all we do. We all we do is just kiss and talk about sex. Um, you know, these absolute ludicrous things um, that I'm sure reared their ugly heads in Australia when you had the um, uh, the the referendum, the postal referendum a few years ago. Um, so not much has changed, but there were also a couple of defining moments. So. This is Kelvin Vreend. He was a lab instructor, a chemistry lab instructor um, at, uh, in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, and he was fired for being gay. And uh, the, court, the, uh, the case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, which ultimately uh, ruled in his favor and enshrined employment protection in the Canadian constitution. Uh, in 1998, uh, there was an American college student named Matthew Shepard who was tied to a fence and beaten to death. Um, and this was sort of the first public, more wider, wider public um, uh, recognition of the violence that LGBTQ plus folks faced. And it was turned into, it, it received heaps of media attention. It was turned into a play by Moises Kaufman and the Tectonic Theatre Project. Um, called the Laramie Project, which also, you know, aired uh, or toured great, you know, quite widely. And that was a real turning point. And then obviously we had um, same-sex marriage in, in 2005. I mean, that was then, and this is now. Um, 
at an organization, uh, a colleague of mine was putting together the seminar series and asked their colleagues for an array of diverse speakers, um, noting that something like 80% of the speakers in the previous five years were cis, white, straight men. Um, and this was one of the responses that they received back. Um, and ultimately, you know, otherwise, you know, there'd be an implication that there is a white patriarchal heterosexual oppressive plot in place in this institution. Yes, this is this is the very point. Um, and, you know, bringing evidence of this activity to HR, perhaps even the police. Uh, you know, so it's a bit it's a bit over the top. It's somebody reacting in a very negative way um, to the idea that not everybody has the same access uh, or opportunity. And one of the other events that we do at LGBTQ plus STEM is uh, LGBTQ plus STEM Day, which is run with a whole variety of organizations across the world. So Queers in Science, which is in Melbourne, um, are one of our partners. Um, and it's sort of organized by a group called Pride in STEM, where we just celebrate, it's a public facing event, we celebrate queer people in science. And when we had the first one, uh, you know, these were some of the fantastic Twitter comments that we get and here's always you know no, don't read the comments but um you know yes <laughs> another dumbass holiday well it wasn't a holiday you didn't get the day off uh can you all find a cure for aids yes we i know several folks that are working on that very very point um the point is we still have a long way to go um and even <laughs> more recently we had uh, museum selfie day uh which is another social media thing uh and uh and so i posted this picture of me with some of what i thought were the campus birds we've got a gouldian finch there in the front and a painted bunting there in the back um and i thought it was you know great and hilarious um to which andrew grau i have no idea who they are uh sexualized ornithology zero decorum um incidentally those of you wishing to sign up for sexualized ornithology i'll be offering that in the spring term of next year um and I just thought this this webcomic name by uh, by Ryan Norris just sort of, you know, just completely captures it. Um, you know, this this is ultimately what it's ultimately what it's about, which when you think about it is pretty silly. So it's all about the little things, right? So getting asked, you know, what does your wife do? Well, I, I don't have a wife, I have a husband. <laughs> um, checking into ho a hotel and being told, um, oh, we've put you in a room with two twin beds as opposed to a double bed. Um, or even just thinking about song lyrics. So, you know, if you're driving the car and you've got the radio on, um, how often do you hear uh, a song that expresses something about relationships pretty often because you know it's great fodder for music. But how often is that about a same explicitly same sex relationship? It's not very often. And when it is, you really tweak to it. Asking, you know, thinking, is it safe to hold hands here? I'll talk about that in a minute. But also regularly watching the crowd and, and plotting a route of escape should you need to, um, especially in unfamiliar, potentially hostile environments. Now, each of these on their own isn't fatal. I mean, I'm still here, um, but they still hurt. They're not brilliant. So speaking of holding hands, um, this is a report from the EU Fundamental Rights Agency um, from last year that, sent, that asked, you know, same-sex uh, couples, do you avoid holding hands in public with a same-sex partner for fear of being assaulted, threatened, or harassed? Um, and you can just see some of the numbers there. So, you know, at the top, Romania, Poland, uh, Bulgaria, uh, you know, more than three quarters said yes. But even down towards the bottom, you look at the UK, it's 37%. That's not insignificant. Um, and it can get really, it's easy to get caught up in these numbers and just think, oh, that's relatively low. But each of these represents hundreds, if not thousands, not tens of thousands of people. Um, have you experienced harassment for any reason 
uh, in the last 12 months. Um, 62% in the UK. Um, but even the lowest is down at, you know, just under half. But it's also the big things. So this is the British Social Attitude Survey, which is an annual, roughly annual survey um, of uh, a cross-cut demographic of the British population uh, on a variety of social questions. And it started in 1983. And this is the proportion of respondents that said same-sex relations are not wrong at all. Um, so you can see sort of dips there in the, in the early uh, to mid 80s, which coincides with the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Um, in the 90s, that's when we had uh, consent lowered to 18. So up until 1994, the age of consent for same-sex acts in the UK was 21. Um, and even then, it was, you know, still only a quarter. By the time we had equal age of consent, uh, it was closer to 40%. We got civil partnerships in the UK in 2004, again, just under 40%. Um, and we had marriage in 2013, which, you know, saw quite a significant rise, almost up to 60%. But even today, what this shows us is that almost three in 10 Britons see something wrong with same-sex relations. And that's the environment in which we're operating right now. Now, we know queer folks are at high risk of poor mental health, um, have got a greater occurrence of depression. Hello, yes. Uh, suicidal thoughts, self-harm, alcohol and drug use, more likely to be assaulted and experience discriminatory um, and harassing remarks. And if you look at the uh, reported hate crime statistics for England and Wales, and this is just reported, mind you, and there's a massive reporting bias um, because the police have not always been the most wonderful to queer folks in the history. It'll come as no surprise to many of you. Um, we can see that the number of uh, reports relating to both sexual orientation and gender identity uh, yeah. are increasing. So now to change uh, topics slightly and a bit more up upbeat uh, and talk about plastic pollution. So um, when I give this talk uh, at scientific conferences, I also I often title it um, the tale of the sheer water in the bottle cap. Um, people ask what I do. I cut open birds and take bottle caps out of their stomachs, which is pretty gruesome, um, but also but also pretty accurate. So you can see there. This is the stomach of a flesh-footed shearwater from Lord Howe Island off the coast of New South Wales. Um, and you can see the bottle cap there right in its stomach. Um, and so uh, for the last, gosh, more than a decade now, decade and a half, um, Jen Lavers and I have been going to Lord Howe Island to try and understand what the heck is going on. Why are these birds eating plastic? What is it doing to them? Um, and for me, this all started uh, on a Qantas flight in 2009. So this is the Lord Howe Island Airport. It's a two hour, roughly two hour flight east to Sydney. Uh, and you go in this little wee dash eight. It's a really short runway as well. Uh, and on this flight, which is ridiculously expensive, um, you get a free meal. Brilliant. So when we went there in 2009, uh, this was our meal. So we've got, uh, a plastic container of water with a separate plastic cup, plastic cutlery wrapped in plastic with a plastic wrapped chocolate bar, a plastic wrapped cookie, which was very delicious, uh, with a plastic wrapped sandwich all in a clamshell of plastic. Um, so you can start to see the trend here. Being diligent scientists that we were, when the flight attendants came around to clear up the rubbish, we kept ours, uh, took it to the lab, and popped it on the balance. Um, it was 55 and a half grams on average. Now we can do a little bit of extrapolation here. Uh, Dash eight seats for about 40 people. Um, at the time, there were nine flights a week to Lord Howe Island. Uh, you can do the math, anyone? Have we got it yet? Just over two tons every year. And that's just on this one flight. 
And the thing about this plastic is, is it's all designed to be used once and then thrown away and never used again. So where do plastics come from? You know, we hear a lot about plastics these days. Um, ultimately, natural products have been, have been molded for, for millennia. Um, but the first plastic um, is only about 170 years ago. And really the first synthetic plastic um, is only about 100 years old. And it was designed uh, as part of a competition to come up with a proper replacement for ivory in billiard balls. Um, and now we've got, you know, plastics, you know, we think oh, it's one, it's one thing. Actually, it's a whole variety of different things. You know, acrylics, polyester, silicones, polyurethanes, even more. And when you look at, for example, um, a drink bottle, and you see the little number in the recycled triangle, this actually uh, tells you what the item is made of, what polymer it's made of. So one, you've got PET, which is sort of your, your standard drink bottles. Um, two is high density polyethylene. So that's, you know, thinking like um, shopping crates or shopping baskets. Um, you've got four LDPE, low density polyethylene. That's the sort of the sheet, sheety type plastics. Um, and then there's this number seven, which is, which is just other, which is literally everything else. Um, so cling film, uh, toothbrush bristles, uh, ABS, you know, my, my computer mouse is made of ABS, um, polycarbonates, so my glasses. I've got CDs there. I don't think anyone has CDs anymore, so I should probably update this slide. Um, but you get the idea. A huge amount of different materials in our lives, and it's not all the same. And it, therefore, it reacts differently uh, in different environments. And the thing about plastics, ultimately, is that they're forever. Um, some quick stats about, about Canada. Um, it employs only about 4,500 people in Canada. It's a $6 billion industry. Only 8% of it is actually recycled. Um, there's roughly that mass amount uh, of kilograms of plastic sitting in the ocean, with another 4 to 13 tons added every year. And if you think about the total number of birds in the world, not just seabirds, but individual birds, you know, you look out your window, there's a, there's a robin or a currawong or a bin chicken. I think every one of those, there's one to 10 kilos of plastic in the ocean for every individual. Um, and with 20 million new pieces of plastic entering the oceans every day. Um, I really like this quote. This is from Heidi Tate, who runs the Tangara Blue Foundation in, in Australia. You know, plastic, ultimately, it doesn't break down. It just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. And on their own, each of these pieces isn't necessarily fatal, but they still hurt. You can see some of the, the parallels here. So plastics, how did we get here in terms of seabirds? Well, the first real study of plastics and seabirds was in the, um, in the mid 1960s by two biologists for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Carl Kenyon and Jean Cridler. And they were looking at indigestible matter in Le San Albatrosses at Midway Atoll in Hawaii. Um, because they were seeing, you know, essentially what, similar to what we see today, Carcasses, dead birds with their rib cages full of plastic, but also, you know, pumice and stones and various other things. I read this paper, gosh, 15, 20 years ago, and I thought, you know, it really, something, something tweaked to me because that was quite new. No one had really looked at this before. Um, and it wasn't until about 2009 or 2010 when, uh, when Carl Kenyon passed away, he received an obituary in uh, the AUK, the Journal of the American ornithologist union at the time, um, in which it mentioned his companion of 39 years, Clarence Larson, um, which I had no idea. So today, what do we see with lace and albatrosses? So there's about three quarters um, in Carl and Jean's study uh, from 1967. And if we plot numbers in the intervening years um, and some of the data that, uh, that we collected more recently, Every single chick 
uh, Les Saint Albatross chick on Midway Atoll has plastic in its stomach. And in some cases, it's fatal. Um, these pictures from Chris Jordan, you can see, look very similar to the ones from, uh, from the paper earlier. Now, if someone asks how you're doing and your two options are alive and dead, that doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room, really. Um, so one of the things we've been doing in the Adrift Lab is trying to understand the sublethal effects of plastics. What is it actually doing to individual birds? Um, so, you know, we've got, uh, we're taking a blood sample from a bird here, and we can look at blood chemistry. So, you know, different enzymes, compounds, um, and ultimately what we found comparing birds with and without plastic. Birds with plastic had um, lower calcium in their bloodstream, higher cholesterol, um, they weighed less, they grew more slowly, so they've got a shorter wing cord, a uh, shorter culmen, and a shorter head bill, so that's sort of the back of the head to the tip of the bill. These are all chicks about the same age, so they're growing more slowly. And if we look at that, you know, how that, and that's just the presence of plastic. That's not even quantifying it. So that could just be one piece. And if we look at, you know, how that relates to the number and the mass of plastic, we can see that there's some interesting trends. So the more plastic, you, you know, the more uric acid, which implies something relating to kidneys and nitrogen excretion, um, more amylase, less calcium. Um, something is definitely going on. Now, what this means for the birds here we don't really know um, because we can't yet figure out how to ask them how they're doing and how they're feeling. Um, but this is this is sort of what we're what we've been working on for the past number of years. So let me transport you briefly to um, the middle of nowhere, or more properly, the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. Um, the blue outline you see there is the. Um, EEZ, the exclusive economic zone of the Pitcairn Islands, which is a UK overseas territory. And the black dot that you see there is a fantastic place in the world called Henderson Island. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a 43 square kilometer raised coral atoll, um, uninhabited, um, and home to five endemic bird species, species found nowhere else in the world. Um, we were lucky enough to go there uh, in 2015 and in 2019, I had to think about that for a minute. That was actually my last time in the field uh, was on Henderson Island, which is pretty special. Uh, and you can see our ship there just on the horizon, the Silver Supporter. It's got really lush vegetation. It's a really rugged environment. Um, And this is a, a, you know, one of the most special places for me in the world. This is East Beach, um, as taken uh, on the 1991 Sir Peter Scott Memorial Expedition to the island, which was a 13-month uh, research trip there. Um, and it looks like, a, I mean, apart from being a bit cloudy, um, you know, it looks like a fantastic tropical beach. You can see the waves there breaking on the reef. And when we went back in 2015, um, that's what we saw. So you can see fishing buoys, crates, rope, fragments, bottles, you name it. Um, and when we basically counted it all up, um, there were 38 million pieces weighing 17 tons. And this is an island that's 5,000 kilometers from really from anywhere. So none of this plastic is originating on the island, or even in the Pitcairn Islands, or even really in Polynesia. It's all coming from other places. And we found, you know, bottles from Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, US, Chile, where you'd expect, but also Scotland, Spain, Canada. Um, because once plastic gets into the ocean, it literally goes absolutely everywhere. Um, and why is it this bad? You know, why have we got, you know, we've got a green sea turtle here um, with some fishing rope, um, some fishing line wrapped around coral, a hermit crab living in an Avon cosmetics bottle, 
Um, and you can see the, the rack line where the high tide mark is there in the bottom right picture. Um, there's not a thousand new items arriving every day. That's not an exaggeration. It's about a thousand items across this two kilometer beach. And it's like this because Henderson sits smack dab in one of the world's five oceanic gyres. This is the South Pacific gyre, um, which basically collects all, all floating things. Um, there's one in the North and South Pacific, the North and South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And it just concentrates them at the ocean surface. And Henderson, you can see, is smack dab right in the middle of one. You think, fine, OK, aside from the aesthetics, why is it actually a bad thing? Well, um, you can see here in this bottle, we've got a whole bunch of little hermit crabs. Now, hermit crabs don't have shells of their own. They need to basically take shells from other animals that have died or other hermit crabs who have outgrown their shell. So when a hermit crab uh, goes into a, a bottle like this, because it's a nice, warm, humid microclimate, um, unfortunately, they can't get back out very easily because plastic is really smooth and drinks bottles are really smooth. And so they can't really get purchased to get out. So they, you know, they tumble in and die, which is really unfortunate. But when hermit crabs die, they release a chemical signal that tells all of their friends, hey, there's a free shell available. You might want to come check it out. Um, and so another hermit crab will come in thinking, ooh, there's a new shell in here. But he won't be able to get out. And then he'll die. And this just, it's an insidious thing. Just, you know, gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And on Henderson Island in the Pacific and the Cocos Keeling Islands in the Indian Ocean, we reckon that there were probably on the order of about six to 700,000 dead hermit crabs just sitting in bottles. And you can see in this bottle in the middle picture here, there's, you know, you can just see them in there. Right, the bottle we had with the most um, hermit crabs had over 500 in them. And these are really important for things like nutrient cycling. They're the main detritivores uh, in these systems. So eating um, you know, bits of detritus from, you know, from vegetation or animals that have died um, and other myofauna. So ultimately, what can we do about it? Well, we focus a lot on the personal changes. So, you know, we say, oh, you know, everyone, you know, bring your reusable bags, bring your keep cut when you go to the coffee shop. Um, but that's, in a way, really downgrading responsibility uh, to the people who have arguably one of the lower impacts in the world. Plastic gets everywhere, like we said. Um, so ultimately what we need is, is some international cooperation. And in the graph here, you can see uh, carbon emissions in gray and plastic production, that's new plastic production in blue. <clears throat> and you can see, you know, the rise is, is almost exponential. If you look at climate change, you know, we've had three sort of seminal environmental agreements over the last number of decades. So 1992, we had the Rio Summit, which basically identified climate change as, as an issue. We had the Kyoto Protocol in 97, which set non-binding targets, and then the Paris Agreement um, just a few years ago, which set binding targets. Now, if we compare that to where we are with plastics, I mean, we, we, we had some early legislation, MARPOL, which um, regulates dump disposal of waste at sea um, in the 1970s. Um, but aside from that, you know, we've got these, you know, the Honolulu strategy, the Rio Plus 20 and, and Clean Seas initiatives. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are all voluntary, non-binding recognitions that there's a problem. So in terms of environmental, international environmental agreements, we're about 30 years behind where we are with climate change. And, and look how much more we have to do with climate change. So ultimately what we need is, is political engagement and public pressure because personal changes, I mean, that's like trying to empty the ocean with a thimble. Um, and of course, we've got the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals. Um, these are 17 goals set out by the UN uh, Development Program, which are really aspirational. And in particular, number 14, uh, which deals with life below water, has uh, a goal of by 2025 to reduce the amount of pollution in the oceans um, 
primarily through plastics and uh, a nutrient runoff, uh, mostly from agriculture. <clears throat> now, 2025 <clears throat> isn't that far away, and we still have a lot of work to do. <clears throat> so ultimately, it's the little things that add up. During this talk, about 300,000 new plastic items will have entered the oceans. 90% are from consumer products, and the vast majority are literally designed to be used once and then disposed of. And the thing about working in plastics is, you know, constantly checking products for the amount of plastics and, and thinking about it is really tiring and, and saddening. Just as thinking about, am I going to be safe in this environment? Can I hold my partner's hand? Um, can also be very tiring and saddening. So, how do we queer our science? Um, I realize this might not play well in Australia, but in the US and the UK, there was a series called Queer as Folk, uh, which uh, aired in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and this is sort of a play on, on their logo, designed by my friend Kevin Bergio. <clears throat> and ultimately, there's something called the Queer Science Manifesto. And this is all about how we approach our science through, uh, through a queer lens. So queer science is all inclusive. It's angry and political and filled with unapologetic agendas. Anyone who thinks science doesn't have an agenda or is completely objective um, is frankly out to lunch. Um, it never has been. And queer science doesn't just go to the moon, it pays for accessibility and that's the key there and insists that any people with any kinds of bodies can dream of being astronauts and it works to achieve that goal. So queer science is, is inclusive and bringing everybody in. <clears throat> it doesn't just revere the past, but it questions the shoulders of the giants that came before. So why is it that, you know, these seminal names that we know from, you know, when we cite papers, how did they get there? How did they feel so confident to be able to stand up so proudly? And who might they have stood on or exploited, or in some cases even killed to get there? <clears throat> um, we celebrate collaboration and community over individualism and ego. Um, and we constantly question and fight for a more just world. And if you're interested, I mean, this, these are just a couple of the points of this, of this manifesto, which was put together by um, Brian, Catherine, and, and Erma. Um, you can find it there. Or if you just Google Queer Science Manifesto, it will come up. <clears throat> and why, you know, fine, how, how is this important? You know, people ask me quite often, what's it like being LGBTQ plus in STEM? And ultimately, think about all the pressures of being in STEM, you know, whether you're a student, a postdoc, faculty, you know, there's lots of pressures around publishing, getting grants, you know, workload, teaching, um, the whole pandemic and, you know, shifting things online and then offline and then online again. Um, take all of that and then add the additional layer of being queer in a heteronormative society. So this is the first real examination here of the workplace environment for queer folks working in STEM by Jeremy Yoder and Alison Mathias. Um, and they found, you know, first of all, queer folks working in STEM, this is primarily an American demographic, were less likely to be out to their colleagues and students than they were to their family. They found that um, the greater the binary gender parity within a field, um, the more open, the more likely folks were to be open. Um, see the dashed line there fills everything. The solid line um, is, uh, sorry, the solid line uh, is for everything and the dashed line omits the, the folks at psychology. But ultimately, the more safe your workplace, the more likely folks were to be out. 
um, the more welcoming, you know, where they, you know, where folks not just treated the same, not just tolerated, but supported and welcomed. Um, and if workplaces have the same amount of support as the straight colleagues, folks were more likely to be out. And this makes intuitive sense, right? You know, the more welcoming and positive your workplace is, the more likely you are to not have to hide those parts of your life. In the UK, a couple of years later, we did the um, Physical Science uh, Workplace Climate Survey. <clears throat> so this is done by the Royal Astronomical Society, Royal Society of Chemistry, and the Institute of Physics here in, in the UK. Um, and 28% you know, of queer respondents and 20% of trans respondents considered leaving their workplace in the last 12 months, um, which compares to 16% of straight respondents. Um, are you out to everyone at work? Uh, folks that are bi or pans, only 14%. Queer questioning, 21, 38% of lesbians, and only 44% of gay men, which in the queer umbrella have the most privilege, really. Um, still less than half. Um, and then, you know, one in five experienced exclusionary behavior. You know, half agreed that there was a lack of awareness of issues in the workplace. Um, a really important one for me, because I work at a, at a museum, you know, uh, don't have access to a, a workplace LGBTQ plus network. Um, and, you know, this is what it comes down to here. Ultimately, what any minority group belonging person wants is when push comes to shove, will my organization support me? <clears throat> um, and a bit of a, a, a bit of a late breaking uh, article. It did come out a bit earlier this year uh, in Science, Science Advances, um, looking at, uh, at responses of about a thousand queer folks um, across the world, um, professionals in, in STEM. Um, we can see that queer folks have uh, fewer career opportunities less likely to have sufficient resources to do their job. They're less comfortable whistleblowing. Um, they feel, they're more likely to feel devalued professionally um, and are more likely to feel socially excluded when, you know, in science, so much of what we do also happens in social spaces, whether that's collaborations, conferences, field work, um, you know, even within our own institutions. Significantly more likely to have experienced harassment, but also, and this is the insidious bit, more likely to have minor health problems, more likely to suffer from insomnia, more likely to be stressed from work, and more likely to have depressive symptoms than straight counterparts. So to try and bring things up to a close, why do I get shouty about rainbows and science? That's what it's all about. <clears throat> well, because ultimately visibility and representation matter. I went through a four-year undergraduate degree, two-year master's and four-year PhD, and I met one other out queer scientist and they were a visiting speaker from Berkeley. Um, at LGBTQ plus STEM, we run a one-day conference called the LGBTQ plus Steminar. Um, the next one will be in January 14th, 2022. It's based in Glasgow, but it will have some online component. Abstract submissions have just opened this week. So if you are interested uh, in presenting your work at a conference that not only accepts, but affirms your identity, um, do get in touch, submit something. And this is some of the, the comments that we see when we put out our, uh, our annual feedback survey. You know, calling it one of the most profound experiences of my life. Um, and, you know, the last one, we, we held this at the Institute of Physics in, in London uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which had one of those giant massive television screens in the lobby. Uh, and we had a rainbow flag up. And, you know, a friend of mine said, you know, I've got to say, I got a bit choked up when I walked in and saw this massive rainbow. It, was, it overwhelmed me to walk into a room 
and feel so immediately validated and completely welcome. Ultimately, that's what we want science to be. Um, and, and I say this to every queer scientist out there. Do you remember what it was like the first time you saw a queer person really just owning it and giving you the confidence to be yourself? And you are that person to someone. And this really matters because science is a really international endeavor. This is a map uh, from December of 2020, looking at laws criminalizing same-sex relationships and behaviors around the world. <clears throat> and we can see, you know, or, or indeed having protections. So, you know, blue is, is good, lots of protections, um, whereas red and, and brown are less good. When I give this talk, to, uh, to a mostly straight audience. Sometimes I have a, a little bit of a quiz, you know, how many countries is, is, would I be illegal? Um, and the answer is about 70. And in 11 of which could face the death penalty. So when we think about science and, you know, this comes to field work, conferences, collaborations, um, facilities, where we travel matters. The first thing I do when somebody says, oh, we need you to go to Ghana, uh, you know, look at the map. Oh, good heavens. No, I'm no, not, go not going to be going there. I interviewed for a faculty job in the UK about five or six years ago. And it wasn't until the interview stage that they said, oh, and one of the things that we want this position to do is teach our international field course uh, in, in Kenya. That's when I knew it wasn't for me. And if we look at where the visitors to the LGBTQ plus STEM logs, we feature interviews with queer scientists. Again, if you're interested in being featured, we've got a simple Google form, fill it in as much or as little as you want. We would love to have some more folks from Australia. Um, we've got about, it's now about 130,000 uh, views and about 1% of those are from countries where being queer is illegal. And to me, that's really important because You know, there's still queer people in these countries. Um, and, you know, we're quite lucky, you know, being I'm um, in the UK, most of you folks are in are in Australia. You're quite lucky. We've got protections. We've got, you know, flawed and imperfect, though they may be. Um, but we get um, at LGBTQ plus STEM, you know, we, we get messages through Twitter like like this. Being gay in Iraq is illegal and punishable by death. I can thankfully report this person is no longer in Iraq and are safe in the third country, but it's really, really sobering. So ultimately, how do we link these two strands together? Well, so we've got equality. This is, this is the problem everyone gets the same thing, but that's not really it because it ignores these systematic barriers that we have in place. There's equity, which means that, you know, brings everyone up to the same level, but ultimately that's just mitigation. The problem is still there. Uh, ultimately, this is the reality. Some people have far more than they need and some people start lower than they should. And ultimately what we want is the solution which is liberation and the complete removal of those systematic barriers. To wrap up, queer leadership in STEM. Um, if you're queer in STEM, you are a queer leader in STEM. Um, try and be the person you wish you had in your own life. I mean, that's again, why I get so shouty about this. Um, it's important to stay safe because your personal safety is paramount, um, but also build support because it is really, really exhausting. And when you dip, uh, you need folks around that will understand and, and will help pick you up. Um, ultimately, fighting is really hard. And anyone who's tried to change the system will know this. Um, so it's important to remember to also try and build things because that's where you're going to have 
greatest impact, not shouting at somebody who's had a really hot take on Twitter. Um, that's going to disappear in two weeks. So with that, I'll thank uh, a huge number of folks um, from all over the world, uh, because good science happens because of good people. Um, and with that, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much.